Oh, man. I always feel like that's a, like, walkout song, and I don't really know what to do afterwards. It's like, now, batting for the Tigers, number nine, you know. I'm not doing that. Okay. Hey, everybody. My name's Meredith. Happy Fuse Day. Um, we're going to get straight into it tonight, so um, I just need y'all, like, sometimes we come out, and I'll, like, tell jokes for a second, or I'll tell a story, but I just need y'all to know I have, like, a different kind of, like... Okay, I just joked about a game, but you know, like, uh, any athletes in the house? You play a sport? Okay, pick an event. Hey, before a, any musical people in the house, you like to do shows? Okay, pick a thing that you get really, like, amped up beforehand. That's how I felt before coming out here. Because I have, I have just like a, uh, what is the right word? Like a desperation for us to uh, get what I want to share with us tonight. Okay, so, uh, because here's what I know, um, y'all are li- like, we're talking about bold ones, we're talking about being bold, we're talking about being brave, but I know there's a lot in your world that's like trying to get you to be afraid, right? Like, hey, let's be bold from the jump. If you've been felt fear this week, will you just raise your hand at every campus? Okay, like, Most of us, and for those of us who didn't raise our hand, it's because we were just afraid to. So you just experienced fear. And here's what I want to tell you. I want to tell you my hand was raised because I want you to even know I feel fear before walking out on this stage. You're like, you never seem nervous. And I'm like, well, praise God. But I I get scared. Like, y'all are intimidating. Y'all are scary. Your Fuse Group leaders are bold. They just walk up to you at school lunches and y'all look like you've never even seen them before in your life. But I want to tell you, I just did it backstage. And so I want to, from the jump, encourage you with something and give you the heart of this series and a tool that you can use when you go back out into every scary situation that will draw your mind to remember why you can be bold. Okay? So we're gonna put this up on the screen. This is the phrase of the series, but I don't wanna just be, don't write it down yet. Don't write it down yet. I love the note takers, just hold hold on. And I want everybody to just put your right hand or left hand, I don't care, I'm not discriminatory based on what your dominant hand is. Put a hand over your heart and I want everybody to take a deep breath. No need to be dramatic. Just take a deep breath. And I want you to repeat after me and say, I can be bold because God is with me. Okay, one more time, controlled. Take a deep breath and repeat after me. Say, I can be bold because God is with me. Literally, just side stage a few moments ago, I did this. Because what I never want to do is come out here and act like I have to put something on or be some kind of person so that y'all will believe in Jesus. The only reason I have any leg to stand on on this stage is because God is with me. And anything that you face when you walk out of here, I wanted this to be like a, you can stop in your room before you walk to school. If you get scared going to school, I want you to stop in your room, put your hand on your heart, take a breath and say, I can be bold because God is with me. You are nervous about a relationship, a school that you should apply for, whatever it is. This is what we want you to take with you from this series because this is not just a phrase of a series. This is a reality and a declaration and a promise that Jesus made himself. Behold, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you wherever you go. And then I want to bless you with this scripture. This is Proverbs 29 or 28 verse 1. And I'm... I want to speak this as like a, an identity over you. Last week, Hai King said that a lot of our boldness comes from knowing the answer to who are you. Well, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want the second part of this verse, I want you to know is who you are, okay? So Proverbs 28 says, the wicked run away when no one is chasing them, but the godly are as bold as lions, Listen to me, Fuse, every campus, I want you to hear this from like a mama in this house. In a generation marked by fear, I believe you can be marked by boldness. Not because of something you have to put on, but because of who is with you. 
Wicked run away when no one is chasing them. You have a lot of people around your school, your friend groups who are just running all kinds of directions because there's a proverbial boogeyman, like if I don't do this, if I don't do this, and you're just like running around like a chicken with your head cut off, trying to find peace, trying to find boldness, trying to find purpose. But the godly are as bold as lions. The only reason a lion would run is because it's on the attack. A lion doesn't run away from nothing. What's hunting a lion? Nothing. You somebody said a cheetah. A lion would tear a cheetah up. Dinosaur, bruh. All right, we got to get you into science class after this. Bring it back. Hey, bring it back. Bring it back. Listen to me. Listen. Listen. Because God is with you, you can be as bold as a lion. That's the confidence we want from this series. Because guess what? That's what Jesus does for his disciples. He makes them bold as lions. And disciples is exactly what we're going to talk about tonight. We're looking through scripture and we're looking at the bold ones, the people who were real people, by the way, in a real place at a real time with real insecurities and real fears and facing real things, but they became bold ones. And we're going to look at, last week you looked at John the Baptist. This week we're going to look at the disciples, not just the 12, because Jesus had like 12 boys who he rolled with. But guess who else was a part of the disciples? Women. So we're going to look at the women as well and see how they became bold ones. But I need you all to hear this. Disciples weren't just back then. Okay? A disciple is just a Christian. In Acts 11, it shows us this, that uh, in a place called Antioch, I know where it is. It's like just go past Myrtle Beach and keep going till. You hit Israel. But Antioch, Antioch is where the disciples were first called Christians. And from that point forward, if you said, I'm a follower of Christ, you're a disciple, a.k.a. you were a Christian. So I I do want you to write this down, that if you were a Christian, all Christians are bold ones. I don't have like a secret stash of boldness from God that I don't tell y'all about. It's like, I can't share this with them because then maybe they'll preach instead of me. I want you to preach instead of me. I'm getting old. I jumped down here at the front during the first song and I hobbled back before the second song to be like, nah, this is just my worship strut. This is just how I... All Christians are bold ones. If you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you're a disciple, you're a Christian, and all Christians are bold ones. Why? Because God is with us. So we're going to look at two examples tonight of some disciples that followed Jesus around back then and learn from them how they can train some modern disciples right now. Make sense? So we're going to look first at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. We're going to learn a little bit from uh, our boys, Simon Peter and Andrew. Simon Peter's one dude. He's got like that double name. He was from southern Israel, I guess. Simon Peter and then uh, his brother, Andrew. See what they have to teach us about boldness. Then we're going to get to the ladies. Okay. Matthew 4, 18 through 20 says this. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, which is in Israel to this day, he saw two brothers, Simon a.k.a. Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Let's leave that up there for a second, because I want y'all on your actual, if you have these notes, there goes my pen. If you have these notes or just in your real Bible, I want you to underline the follow me and I will make. Okay? Follow me, I will make. Follow me, I will make. I want you to see here that the first call of Jesus is not for his disciples to go and do anything. The first call of Jesus to the disciples back then and to every single disciple now is, no, 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 follow me. Come close to me and I will make. Now, I want want you to hear the right tone. 
This is not Jesus going, follow me and I'm gonna make you fishers of men. That's not, that's not what Jesus is doing. Like, Simon, Peter, I see you're catching fish. Follow me, I'm gonna make you fishers of men. That's not his, I don't know if Jesus ever bows up like that, except to the devil, and the devil's like, no. But that's not Jesus' tone here. The original word there, because the Bible wasn't originally written in English, all right? It was written in Greek. I know you all have been studying that in school. Just kidding. But the make actually means to bring along or to cause. So Jesus is saying, as, I fo- as you follow me, as we walk together, I'm going to make you into the kind of person you never thought you could be. So what can we learn from this? As I follow Jesus, he makes me bold. As I follow Jesus, he makes me bold. Um, Okay, this is great, talking about the tone, and Jesus wasn't doing this to people. Uh, y'all, ever, y'all have those friends, you just get around them, and they make you into a different person? Kaylin laughed, because we get weird. Things, it's, you know, it's like you get with that one friend, and all of a sudden you're like, no one would understand these jokes. No one would understand why this is funny. But I get around you, and you just make me weird. You know what I mean? Um, and it's like, Kaylin's, my friend Kaylin is not coming to be like, I'm going to make you weird. Like, that's not, it's like, nah, just by being around her, I get weird. Um, my friend Lee McDermott, y'all have heard him preach before. He did the uh, sermon a few weeks ago that y'all to be quiet for 30 minutes. I thought that was brilliant. But I get around him and he just like makes me feel smarter. I'm like walking a little straighter, like using different vocabulary words. I'm like, why, yes, I did read that in Isaiah chapter 30, Lee. I sure did. Read it this morning while I was reading my Bible for two hours. <laughs> Don't lie. But I get around him, just something about being in proximity to that person, being close to that person, and it makes me into a different kind of person. That's exactly what happens as we are following Jesus. As you just stay close to him, he just makes you bold. You start doing stuff you never would have done before. Do y'all know it was never my goal to do this? Like to stand in front of a bunch of students and a bunch of people and be like, Jesus is Lord. That was not, that was, I was like, I'm gonna play softball for the rest of my life. And then I realized there is an end to that. Not trying to ruin anyone's dreams, just telling you, not everyone goes to the Olympics. All right. But I started following Jesus and he just made me into the kind of person that could be bold. And I'm telling you, my main call tonight is not go and be bold. It's the same call of Jesus. Follow him as close as you can. Follow him as close as you can. Read your Bible, not so you can tell your fuse group leader you read your Bible. Read your Bible so that you can get close to him. I don't want you to not talk to your friend during a fuse service so that I can feel better about myself. I want you to not talk to your friend in a few service so you may be able to hear the voice of God and you can get close to him and he can make you into a different person. As you follow Jesus, he makes you bold. That's what he did with people all throughout scripture. Normal people, these were not like superhero people, like Super Peter and Super Andrew. They were just some fishermen like this, by the way, casting nets. They didn't fish like this. Some of you bass fishermen get it. They were throwing a net out like that, normal people. And as they followed Jesus, he made them bold. Now, bold for what? He made them bold to do what? Just like go be loud? By the way, let me just say this. Because there's somebody in here, somebody who's a little too loud and somebody who's a little too quiet who needs to hear this. Bold does not mean loud. I'm not trying to come at any... Anybody, but a lot of times the people who are the loudest are actually the most insecure. And I'm saying that because God's convicted me with that. He spoke to me, there's the, I joked about Isaiah 30, but in Isaiah 30 it does say, in quietness and trust is your strength. Some of us need to be need, learning need to be bold and just a little quieter. And some of us need to learn like, well, I'm, I'll never be like as boisterous as them or as like, I don't, that's just not my personality. God does not need a certain personality type. He just needs somebody who's willing. So if you think like just the way you are is a reason God wouldn't embolden you, no, nah, no, nah, I wanna speak death to that tonight and tell you, you may be just the kind of person 
Jesus wants to embolden to do something crazy. Okay, so bold to do what, Peter and Andrew? <clears throat> Look at this. I'm actually gonna read the scripture first. It says this in 4, 19 through 20. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men immediately. Everybody say immediately. Yeah, I like that you said it how I did. Nice. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Now, this may not mean as much to us now as it did then, but remember, they're casting nets because they'd been trained their whole lives to cast nets. This would be the equivalent, like this is their whole livelihood. This is like generation after generation after generation, like Andrew and Peter's dad and his dad and his dad were probably fishermen and this is like what they were gonna do with their life. This was their livelihood. This is how they were gonna eat. This is how they were gonna provide for their family. This would be the equivalent them dropping their nets and just being like, I'm not gonna live, that ain't gonna be my source anymore. The equivalent today would be like LeBron just dropping a basketball and never getting back on the court. Well, he's getting older, so maybe he should do it pretty soon. This, hold on, this would be the equivalent of, I don't know, your favorite TikToker, like deleting all their accounts and you never, I know, <gasps> and then your screen time goes down. This would be the equivalent, this is gonna get whichever direction, I don't care because we need to, whichever way the idol falls, we need to go ahead and poke it. This would be like Taylor Swift dropping the microphone and being like, I'm never gonna do it again. Okay, okay, okay. Bring it down. Bring it down. Here's all I'm going to say. However way you just, hey, I didn't mean to like dupe you, but here's all I'm going to say. If you responded a little too on the heartbroken side, maybe we need to love Taylor a little less. If you responded a little too loudly, maybe we need to hate Taylor a little less. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. She's a real human being with a real soul. Celebrities are real people with real souls. You know that? Okay, thank you. But I need you, listen, I need you to see, I need you to see that this was life shifting for them to drop these nets and follow Jesus. So here's what I want us to get from this personally, not pointing the finger at anybody else, but this, being bold means giving up what used to mean a lot to me. When those disciples dropped their nets, they were giving up for Jesus what their whole life was going to be focused around. When we get close to Jesus, he gives us the boldness to give some things up. And I'm gonna give y'all an opportunity in a few minutes to work with the Holy Spirit and see if there's anything you need to be bold with and give up for Jesus but we haven't gotten to the ladies yet. So let's read about the ladies. If, if, you, uh, if you wanna, um, no, 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 let's just read it. Okay, this is Luke 8, one through three, another instance, interaction with Jesus, and look what it says. Soon afterward, Jesus began a tour. Jesus went on tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12, so Peter and Andrew are still there. Along with some women, say hey. Yeah. Along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager. Susanna and many others who were contributing, look, look, look. Who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. Okay, I just wanna do a quick like little profile of these three women that are named. You had Mary Magdalene. Seven demons had been cast out of her. She had had a massive encounter with Jesus and apparently because of that encounter, the resources that she had, she said, Jesus, you can have whatever you want. I just wanna be a part of this. We don't know if she had a lot of money 
I don't know. She might have been rich, but all I know, that scripture doesn't say that. It just says the resources she had, she made them available to Jesus and said, use them. Now, Joanna, Joanna had some money, okay? Because Joanna was the wife of Chusa, who was Herod's business manager. Herod was like the leader of the region in the day. So Herod has some money, which means Chusa has some money, which means Joanna has some money. But Joanna did not see her wealth as something that just belonged to her. She said, she handed it over to Jesus and said, you can use it however you want. And then there's Susanna, and all we know is her name. We don't know much about her, but apparently she had had an encounter with Jesus and had said the same thing as Mary Magdalene and Joanna. And I specifically, I wanted to make a point about this here. There's some people, Fuse, I want you to look at me. There's some young men and women who've been a part of Fuse for a really long time. And you've been diminishing what you can do for Jesus because your story just isn't that interesting. Like, I don't know, I just have a story. I like grew up in church and got saved when I was young. I've been in Kids Spring and Fuse ever since. And like, I don't have like a massive testimony. And I'm here to tell you, we don't know much about Susanna's story, but I know she was important enough to Jesus for her name to be mentioned as someone who helped support his ministry. Your story is never too small for Jesus to invite you in to a massive mission. Y'all hear me? So what can we learn from Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and these other women? Being bold means handing Jesus whatever I have so that he can use it. Being bold means handing Jesus whatever I got so that he can use it. This is different from um, giving something up, okay? Because it doesn't say like they handed over to Jesus and then they were still a part of what their resources were doing. So it was just like, here, Jesus, you can have it because I want to be a part of it. Let's do this together. And I think some of y'all might be nervous right now that I'm about, like this message is a a, like, be bold for Jesus and quit everything you've ever liked. That's not, that's not what this message is. Like break up with all your boyfriends and girlfriends and don't play any sports and only serve at church and be here at prayer at 6 a.m. every morning and fast till you throw up. Like that's not, that's not what this message is. Because I want to, I want to share my testimony. Can I share my testimony with y'all? When I was a junior, yeah, a junior going into my senior year of college, I like got lit on fire for the Lord. Like God got a hold of my heart and I like started serving at Fuse, which is I'm not gonna tell you how many years ago this was. And I, but my whole life had been focused on playing softball. I'd played softball in like from the time I was, you know, five years old, I played in middle school. In high school, the goal was to get to college. And then I got a softball scholarship to Anderson University and I'm living the dream, I did it. And before my senior year of high school, I felt like God was telling me to give up playing softball. And I was like, oh my gosh. I had, y'all, I had the appointment scheduled with my coach to quit. Because I was like, this is my calling, I gotta do it. And it was literally the night before my appointment with the coach, my parents drove down from North Carolina to be like, she's losing her mind. And let me tell you what Jesus taught me. I ended up not quitting because Jesus didn't want me to give it up. He just wanted me to stop acting like softball belonged to me. So I'm not telling you, some of y'all may need to give something big up, but I'm saying most of us probably need to take the athletic ability, the singing skill, the, um, the artistic ability that we have, the, the, some of y'all are so smart, like the way that you think, and you're like, I'm going to an Ivy League, I'm going. And all, what Jesus is saying is like, hey, that thing you have, will you just hand it to me and watch what I can do with it? And then my senior year, my senior year of college, I played better than I ever played. Because it was no longer about me. It was like every time I walked into practice to the dugout, I was like, God, what are you doing here and how can I be a part of it? My resources are yours. My talent is yours. My time is yours. Let's go for this. And I believe God's gonna invite us into a lot of that right now. So I have two questions that I want us to, 
to personally wrestle with the Holy Spirit about tonight as we wrap up, okay? The first question is this. What do I need to give up for Jesus? What do I need to give up for Jesus? I just told you all the things Jesus didn't ask me to give up and hand over. But I'll tell you all, there are some dreams that Jesus has asked me to give up and walk away from. But he gave me better. So I'm actually, I'm going to leave a minute right now. And I want you to just listen. And if the Holy Spirit tells you something, just write it down. This is not talk to your friend time, fuse group leaders. You can feel all boldness to correct students right now, but listen listen for the Holy Spirit. And if he tells you anything, just write it down. I'm gonna give you 45 seconds. Go ahead and do that. If you're still listening, still journaling, I want you to keep doing that. But everybody else, I just want you to close your eyes. And I just want to invite anyone who maybe you closed your eyes to ask God that question and he said, will you give me your life? You've never received salvation. You've, maybe you've even grown up in church. Heck, maybe you, you grew up in Kid Spring. But you realize I'm in walking the walk, I'm in talking the talk, but I don't know, something just happened during worship tonight and I felt the grace of God. I realized the sacrifice that Jesus made for me, that he paid for my sin, so I didn't have to pay for my sin and I want, I want to give him my life tonight. And if that's you, just right now on every campus, will you put your hand up over your head, every campus, if that's you, you want to give your life to Jesus tonight, everybody else's eyes should be closed. Leaders, if you see at any campus a student with their hand raised, um, you can tap them on the shoulder and go have a conversation with them. And for everybody else, I have one more question. And this is the, maybe you don't need to give something up, but number two, what do you need to hand over to Jesus? Maybe you just realized tonight that sport, I've been clinging onto it like it's mine. I haven't been letting Jesus touch it. I hand it over to him tonight and say, hey, let's do this together. Hey, in groups, I would really encourage you, let this be one of the big questions you talk through. Fuse group leaders, what do I need to hand over to Jesus? What is like mine? And I need to just let Jesus in. Here's the last thing I wanna do. As we're about to move into response, I want us to end the same way we began. And I want everybody to just take one of their hands, put it on their heart like this, and I want you to hear me. Followers of Christ, you are the bold ones. Empowered by the Holy Spirit to do whatever he asks you to do. Tomorrow at school, if he asks you to go talk to a person who's usually walking by themselves in the hallway, I want you to put your hand on your heart. It doesn't have to be in the middle of the hall and I just want you to go repeat after me. I can be bold because God is with me. And maybe you've been just like riddled with fear even now. I want this to be just like the cry over you. 
one more time, I can be bold because God is with me. So listen, we're going to get a chance to practice that right now, to practice some boldness. We're about to respond at every campus, but maybe you need to um, be bold and you know there's something Jesus is asking you to give up. It's okay to say, I don't want to, but I want to want to. And you need to come to the front of whatever campus, in front of the stage at the altar, and you just need to kneel and ask Jesus to give you the boldness to give it up or to hand it over. Maybe as we worship, you just need to keep journaling. Maybe you need to tap your leader on the shoulder or a friend and just say, will you lay a hand on me and speak that over me? Because like, I don't feel it right now. That's what community is for. That's what we do for each other, okay? So however you need to respond in this next time, we're gonna respond differently at every campus. But just remember, you can be bold because God is with you, with me and also with you. Let me bless y'all. I just want, the last thing I want you to hear me say is I believe in you. God doesn't need you, Fuse doesn't need you to be perfect. Ain't nobody asking you to, to be perfect. We just wanna help you as you follow Jesus. So let me pray for you to go be faithful in your boldness. Father, I, I bless right now from sixth grade to whatever the oldest leader is at whatever campus, a spirit-filled wave of boldness over this community. Not because that's what good Christians do. We don't go just do crazy stuff. Some of the bold things we need to do are actually very humble. They're actually very quiet. Nobody's gonna write stories about them, but heaven will rejoice over us as we step out in boldness. I speak right now, there's some young men at every campus who are terrified that if they start talking differently around their friends, they're gonna be called out for it. And I just speak boldness over them. Be bold and use your language differently. There's some young women who realize I've got to start hanging out with some different friends because these friends are making me into somebody I don't wanna be like. I just speak boldness over those young women. There's some leaders at campuses who've been holding on to something with clenched fists. And I don't know what it is, but I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would embolden them to open their hands and to give it over to you. God, this is the joyful life. This is the fun life. This is the beauty of following Jesus. Would you capture, like, just sweep us up in wonder, even as we worship here in a second, that, oh my, like, expand our vision for what our future could be if we would stop living in fear of man or comparison or what our mom and dad told us, but if we would step forward in boldness in the life that you, Jesus, died and rose again that we can walk in. God, I pray that kind of boldness. Would students not settle for the status quo, but walk out differently because they said, I can be bold because God is with me. Speak to us now, God. We love you. You are the actual best. It's in Jesus' name, amen.